Hello and welcome to a bumper edition of The Phone Show where this week we're going to be talking about pretty much everything, John McCann. Yep. Are you excited? Always, General check. Always excited. Compared to last week, more excited, less excited? More, more excited, oh, definitely. thank God. Right, let's go jump right in to the HTC One E8. John, you've seen this obviously for the first time this week. Yep. It's like an M8, but it's got less good materials on it and a less good camera. Fewer and less. Fewer and less. <laughs> Great grammar, well done. All I'm together. Very proud of you. Um, so basically, yeah, it's, very, it's the same phone as the HTC One M8 uh, in the fact that it's got the same screen, same Sense 6, same processor, same battery. It's essentially the same phone, but just repackaged again. And like I said, the only thing that I find odd is that they've got rid of the Geo camera. I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, that is an interesting step away from a camera technology which they're trying to, to ingrain into the general consciousness of consumers and <coughs> having it only on the one phone, they dropped it for the One Mini 2 as well. So it's a difficult message for the HTC to get across. They've got this one camera which they're saying is brilliant, yet the lower down phones, they deem that instead of having two sensors on the back, uh, what is it, 16 megapixel sensor on the rear yep. instead? And for an average consumer, that may sound like a better camera than the Duo camera setup. Well, exactly. I mean, I've done a bit of research and sort of tried to find out how the Duo camera is being sold in shops. You know, basically going around asking, you know, What's that? What's the, what's the Duo camera on the back? The amount of responses I've got are crazy. It's, a lot of people have said, oh, it, it takes two 4 megapixel shots and creates a 60 megapixel one. Uh, the top one's a flash. Uh, it, you know, only one person has said, oh, it allows you to focus the rest of the room. Everyone else has gone, either I don't know, and these are people that work in the phone shops themselves, I don't know, or just erroneous stuff about what actually happens. Um, and the problem is that if you go into these shops and you, you see the, sort of the specs listed next to it, only one, I think, uh, only one had, you know, ultra pixel duo camera. You know, the real benefits of it, low light and that kind of thing. The rest had four megapixel sensor. And it's like, you see this next to this one, you're thinking, well, that's got a much better camera. When in reality, this is off the shelf. The other one's custom built. You know, it uses the image processing chip a lot better. So it's a, it's an odd one. I mean, the good part of this, obviously, as well, is that it's. 60% the cost of the One M8. That's a, a lot cheaper compared to you know the full blown mm -hmm. version, and. I mean, it depends how this, this you know, would be sold in contract, but for the consumer looking just to get an HTC high-end phone doesn't really care so much about the design, it's a good choice, I think. But next up, we've got Microsoft yes. killing Nokia X. It was fun while it lasted for a whole bang, bang. six months or whatever, wasn't it? I know. It's, yeah. we, we did a feature on it recently saying how, you know, I think it was Nokia X is the best phone you'll never buy. Um, and there was a lot of appetite for it out in India. I mean, mm. uh, in, in the... Um, and sort of other de developing countries, there's you know the places where Google Play Store isn't as popular because people don't realise that in you know in some parts of China, uh, Russia, you know the, the side loading of third party apps is, is massive, so you don't necessarily have to have all the Google full power just to really be using Android out there. And I think that you know it's it's a shame that Microsoft has been, you know, so close minded on the fact that it's it's got this quite interesting concept mm. and it could have really pushed it. Yeah, and I mean. It, a lot of people don't know that, that Nokia is still a huge, the majority player in a lot of developing yeah. countries. That's the brand that people go to still. While us, us in Europe and America and Australia, we're looking towards other brands now. Nokia's fallen behind mm. in developing worlds. Nokia is the brand to go to. It's the affordable option. It's a solid phone. It works. Mm. That's what everyone has. And it's that dominance could be affected by this as we're seeing more and more uh, companies churning out the really low end stuff. Samsung have got a few really low end handsets yeah. as well that they're trying to push into the developing market yeah. and it's only going to be increase. And I think, you know, the Asher range didn't really work. I mean, and you know, Nokia X was, was the point of saying like, right, we need to go one step better than Asher, you know, and Microsoft seems to be just going, well, let's just make sure Windows Phone can, can be that. And I think it can be the vehicle for that. But the more you push Windows Phone to the lower end, the harder it becomes to sell it as a really premium, you know, top end competing with the Galaxy S5 and that kind of thing as an operating system. It's very difficult to have something that scales, you know, not just from the high end down to sort of budget, but way beyond that down to the 50 pounds, 40 pound phones. You know, when we've got the, uh, with the new version of Android One, I mean, those, those kind of phones, that's gonna be a big push in that area as well. So, I don't know, I feel like it was a bit closed minded from Microsoft to Especially, think. Especially, I mean, and now we'll get the Nokia X2, which has already been announced, and that's probably it. Yeah, well, it's almost certainly it because yeah. said future devices are gone. It does. It does make me wonder if Nokia. You know, it was it was three or four years ago when there was a should Nokia be doing an Android phone, and they said, oh, we couldn't differentiate. I mean, on the one hand, I think 
if we'd had four years of Nokia Android by now, it would be something really great. On the other hand, at the same time, Microsoft was helping you know, out a lot back then. Yeah. There was a lot of close collaborations and money going backwards and forwards. Um, you know, whether Nokia could have survived just trying to strike out on its own in a congested pool, that would be quite difficult. But I, I think it would have been, you know, I look at like the, the Lumia 930, it's a really quite nice phone and, you know, it's well designed, it's iconic. Uh, it's a bit chunky, but I just don't like Windows Phone and it. it's still a step behind, the apps aren't there, that kind of thing. And I feel like if Nokia had been with Android by now, it's something really good. But anyway, that's done, it's in the past. The future that's, yeah. is IFA that's 2014. The big one. Yep. Um, I think we're going to see some big phones this year. In both terms of size <laughs> and oh, interest. See what you've done there then. Wow. Galaxy Note 4. <laughs> yep. The phablet. The phablet. So what, what we think of Galaxy Note 4? It's already getting quite a lot of interest. Uh, usually the Note series come out and it's the most powerful phone in the world. Yeah. That's generally how Samsung sells it, as well as obviously having a massive screen and the S Pen stylus. So possibly four Not gigs of RAM. Not Pen S, no, no. never Pen S. No, Mark Jacksfield. <laughs> <laughs> um, but always... Uh, Lots of RAM, lots of processor power. We could see an 805 chip, one of the first phones to run. I think it absolutely will do, yeah. Uh, and that would be massive. The 4K capabilities of that chip alone are amazing. I've seen lots of demos and stuff from Qualcomm, and it can do some impressive stuff, but it will be interesting to see how Samsung manages all that. The camera could well get a boost. There's lots of imaging stuff going on there as well. Would it be the first Android L phone? <sighs> I, mean, it, I would think it would be unlikely. Often, though, the newest version of Android goes with the Note. Does it? We've seen, yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, it's often, well, at least one of the first, it's usually the first Samsung phone that picks up the latest version. Yeah, but the timing may be a bit difficult launch. because, yeah, Android L isn't supposed to launch until yeah. later in the autumn, but I don't know, maybe it could be. It could be a preview. I mean, at the very least, it'll be one of the first to get it. Um, it's just because I'm thinking it could be 64 bit, that's Android L, it's yeah. got the capability within it, uh, 805 processor, so a much bigger battery, and also, as we're hearing, two versions possibly, one with flexibility involved, like the yeah. Galaxy Round. Um, you know, if Samsung's going to make flexible phones a thing in the, in, the, in the real world rather than just sort of for a few Asian enthusiasts, I think it's, uh, this is the kind of time to do it. You know, bring a metallic, flexible, you know, curved, not necessarily flexible yeah. to moves, but a curved device. I think that'd be really interesting. It'd be something at least to talk about because Galaxy Note 4 will be great and it'll be powerful and everyone will look up, look and wonder what it's going to be, but it'll be an iteration again, won't it? It will just yeah. be but a Will it just S5. be another G Flex then? Yeah. Well, the LG G Flex arrived, it actually went on sale in quite a lot of stores, but no one really got one. But that was a proof of concept, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, I think, I'm pretty sure H, um, LG was of the same thought that this was just them leading the way in innovation. It was very expensive, it had a 720p screen, really great battery, but and it was a bendy phone. Yeah. You would buy it if you just had too much money and wanted to try something. Galaxy Note 4, Again, I think the sort of the flexible variant could be a little bit niche and more of a proof of concept, mm. but at least it'd be more widely available because Galaxy Round was just located yeah. around, I think, south in South Korea. But um, yeah, I'm interested to see it. That, that, like I said, that'd be good because I don't want to see another Galaxy S5 boosted up. You know, I, I want to see something better there. In terms of screen, what are you thinking? Are we going to get bigger? Is it going QHD, to it's got to be, surely. It must be. I With mean, the G3 out now at five and a half inches. And the Samsung Galaxy S5 LTA yep. A, or whatever you want to call it, in yep. South Korea. You know, they've made a version of that Samsung, so they've definitely got the capability. A larger screen size makes it easier to, yep. to fabricate, whether the, you know, whether AMOLED can sort that far, I don't know, but I'm assuming it, it probably could. So it'll be, it'll be the best of everything, and I think it... In terms of the actual size of the screen, do you reckon they're going to go bigger again, or are they going to sort of stick around 5.9? Because surely anything bigger than that is just going to get too big for the hand. Well, I think if it goes a little bit bigger, then it would have to be bezel that, that loses yeah. out. I mean, we saw the possible renders of the Sony Xperia Z Ultra, <laughs> all the words, Z Ultra 2 or the ZX3 or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that looked very bezel-less, and you know, I'm not sure that's, that's totally real, but yeah. the idea being that we get almost no bezel is, is quite exciting. I mean, I think Sony's going to be quite active at IFA. I mean, yeah. we're seeing rumours of, you know, the new Z3, uh, the Z3 Compact without the Z2 yeah. Compact ever turning and up. the Z3X Ultra or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Maybe as yeah. Well. I mean, I'd imagine the Ultra would be a bit later in the year, but yeah. those two could arrive together as sort of a, a little family. It's Ultra. an interesting play from Sony, who mm. are, it seems to be quite clearly now hammering six-month cycles. Which is weird, isn't it? It is. It is considering a lot of people on two-year contracts, so even an annual re reboot of phones is purely just for the companies to stay up to date. But then again, it gives you a good it gives you a good sort of market, doesn't it, really, I suppose, because you've got the Samsung Galaxy S new version, the new HTC. Mm -hmm. um, that's at the beginning of the year. Sony competes there. Then we've got the iPhone six coming in September, uh, a Galaxy S five Prime mm -hmm. or an Alpha or something along those yep. lines. Um, 
Which I think the, I think the alpha is going to be quite interesting. We, we forgot to touch on that. Yeah. You know, a kind of a possibly uh, maybe smaller uh, metal screen. Oh, sorry, metal screen. That would be really good. <laughs> you couldn't see anything. Um, you know, maybe a smaller screen, but maybe you know, just sort of like metallic, uh, premium materials, yeah. lots of power. Something that actually competes with the iPhone. I mean, imagine if they both came out at four point seven inches. Yeah. As, uh, that's that sort that, of fusion between the S five LTE in yeah. South Korea and some premium design. Exactly. Yeah, that would be really interesting to see, and you know, we could see that again at Eva. Bring it out around the time of the iPhone or a separate event, but um, yeah, I mean Sony. Yeah, the Z3 would then compete with with those two. It would have a really good market to play into. Again, it's just keeping keeping it fresh. I feel like six months for a new flagship is you know, it's great for us, something to talk yeah. about, something to review. But it's you know for the consumer, the, you know, it takes about three or four months to ramp up the messaging and the marketing, yep. and by the time it's properly at its hype, suddenly there's a new phone out. And, and I mean the, the Z2 will still be in stores and still relatively new, so it's a confusing message. For is, consumers. Exactly. And you know, the Z1 Compact will still be there, and the Z3, so I don't know. But I mean, it, it, it looks like it'll be a, another iteration on the Z series. It'll be a bit thinner, a bit faster, nothing overly different, but. You know. Are we expecting anything big from LG or HTC at uh, IFA? No, I don't think it's, that's not their kind of battleground, is it really? I mean, um, we've, we've been hearing Nexus tablets, but they're likely to be sort of launched separately if they do exist. That would be, again, to go back to Android L, that would be when that would happen, surely, wouldn't yeah. it? It would be, you know, when an Android L turns up, it's the, this is the tablet to come out with it. Um, you know, the Nexus 9 or Nexus 8 is what HTC is reportedly working on. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, if, if that uses, if HTC uses its design now, so in that, it'd be quite a nice tablet. I mean, you know, th there's been some decent Android tablets that sort of go under the radar, like the G-Pad from LG is quite a nice device. Yep. Um, you know, LG has got the, you know, so HTC has got the ability to make some decent devices. So something that looks good and feels good in the hand and, and fits in properly would be quite interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing what, what HTC does there. Uh, maybe even more, you know, there could be a 10 and a 7 that HTC yeah. do themselves as well, we're hearing. So that'd be quite cool. And the final thing we should talk about is what's left for the market. You know, we've got a few companies still left trickling around. I mean, what about BlackBerry? I mean, are we going to see a resurgence? It seems, Can it happen? It seems extremely unlikely to see a resurgence in, in the form of getting back to the prowess that they had in the handset market well, that's, five that, years that's, ago. That's almost impossible. It, yeah. Will BlackBerry go completely under? I wouldn't have thought so. They, 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 their back-end systems are all still very highly integrated into lots of huge companies, and yeah. they do lots of good stuff on server side, security side, uh, you know, sort of uh, device management and all that. So. Blackbeard as a company will still keep going, although it's... What about the Passport? You've seen that the recently. The Passport is... That looks a bit insane. It does look a bit insane, but... In it's a good got way. people talking about Blackberry yeah. again, and, you know, that's something good. Obviously, the Blackberry fans seem to love it, yeah. but whatever Blackberry makes, they seem to love. Um, that's what fan, fans do. And again, <laughs> I, it will be very specially targeted to certain markets. But it's square. It is, it is... It reminds me of the Optimus view. Yeah. I remembered when that came out, 4 by 3 screen, and we just thought, this is stupid. And, you know, a similar thing. It doesn't look very manageable. The keyboard is so thin and wide. It doesn't look particularly easy so to you don't, type you, on. you don't think it's going to be an interesting phone? I mean, all the messaging around has been, actually, it's really easy to use. The screen's nice and wide, so it can actually run Android apps if you wanted to sideload them on, yeah. as well as BlackBerry apps. Of course, but it's a square screen. Apps yeah. are made for a 16 by 9 ratio. Yeah. So immediately, you've got an issue there. Um, and that will make apps difficult, okay. especially if you're sideloading them. They could do all sorts of funny things on there. And what about the... The uh, Chinese revolution that we're still seeing happening, obviously OnePlus, you know, it's going okay. I mean, I think sort of the wave is starting to come down a little bit. Because, yeah, and I mean, Oppo is yeah. still doing a lot of stuff. They, they're always hammering on about the Find 7, the new, Xiaomi. slightly newer Xiaomi. They've just launched the Mi 4, yeah. Mi 4, I don't know how they say it. Yeah. Uh, but these are all, they all have decent phones with high-end specs, with, with components that we know. They're running Snapdragon 8 at one point. Mi 4 sounds example. quite nice. Exactly, it's got a, a stainless steel frame. It's sort of very iPhone-esque in design. Yep. There's no surprise there. It comes in black or white, there's a surprise. But you can change the backs to various different covers, which is lovely, I guess. Yeah. Um, but they're all affordable as well. You know, this it is seems it, yeah. 300 to $400, so. The, it could come under 300 pounds then. Exactly, yeah. So it could be very sort of one plus territory, but you're getting all your high-end specs in there. So it's just, can they, will they expand to the rest of the world? Xiaomi is huge in China. Mm. They've got sort of Apple levels of interest and dedicated fans. Yep. And when they launch a phone, people get really excited. Although outside of China, it's relatively unheard of. So, and the company has, 
has visions to obviously go global, but it hasn't done that yet. And it'll be interesting to see if it's the Mi 4, which they're going to try and push out, or if it's going to be the next few iterations. So we're done for another phone show. Quite sad. Why? It ends. I hate the end of stuff. But you can still get more from us if you want to like, subscribe, or comment below. That gets the best from Tech Radar. John? Thank you very much for watching. Later. Yep, around and around. Yep. Yeah. <laughs>